uh, what a what a blessed day and what a privilege it is to share on this resurrection morning. It's always an honor because you're like you know heaven's watching to see if you mess up. <laughs> you know, not really. They're not. You know, no condemnation, but really, don't mess it up. <laughs> Anyways, no pressure, but uh, God is good, yeah? Amen. Hey, so we're, t- we're, we're starting a new series today. We're starting a new series, and, and it is. We're, at, we're talking about, can God be trusted? And over the next few weeks, it, it, you know, I, I like what Emmy said in the video there. It's like, obviously, the answer is yes. Anybody that's a believer is like, well, yeah, God can be trusted, but so few do. And so there's, you know, why is that, you know? And then, you know, for those that say, yes, he can be trusted, uh, Why? Why can he be trusted? You ever thought about that? You know, why can you trust God? And, and so we're actually going to be talking about the, the underlying theme of this series. is going to be a discussion about covenant and what covenant is and stuff. But as we talk about can we trust God, it's important to, for us to realize that what you believe about God, what you believe about the word, and if you were to say, yeah, I can trust God because I believe God's word, well, what about God's word do you believe? Because you actually don't believe what God says in scripture, you believe what you interpret God says in scripture. Yeah, so we we actually, because that's why there's so many different interpretations and every single person with a different interpretation is saying about themselves, I believe the Bible, you don't, (laughs) right? And so the key word here, when we talk about can God be trusted and where we trust him, is this this word that we love called study, Bible study. And now here's the thing, what I used to do, I used to try to study God's word for a buzz. You know, I feel good, I, I, I got God's word in me real quick, you know, I was like, I felt good, I felt strong, and, and guess what, 90% of the time I read God's word, I didn't know what I was reading, and there ain't no buzz, it was dry. It was boring. And using words I don't understand. Like, come on, give me a break, preacher, man. You saying, read my Bible. I'm trying. And then you give up and you stop. But it's something that we have to understand is, is friends don't let friends study the Bible alone. Because you are not the final authority on what the correct interpretation of Scripture is. And what I'm getting at is how we trust God and how we interpret Scripture correctly. And here's a principle I live by that I suggest you all can live by. And it is this. If you read and listen to one person, you become a weirdo. I mean, clone. There's a lot of cult followers out there because they only listen to one sect, one group. And Paul put it this way. That in the end times, there would be people with itching ears that look for speakers that will scratch it. So they're not looking to be challenged. They're looking to find somebody that agrees with everything they agree with. And that's bad. That's not good. And if you only have one sect of Christianity, one group, one speaker, you become a clone. And what if they ain't right? Now, if you read or listen to two people, you become now confused. He said this. He said this. Which one is it? You read 10 people And here's the thing, people up here with one and two, or with one, they think they have their own voice. They think they actually have interpretations. They think they actually have opinions. No, they're just mouthpieces for who they follow. But when you begin to follow and listen and read 10 different people, and now reading is important. When you read 10 people, you start to develop your own voice and thoughts. But that's not even our final goal. When we read hundreds, we become wise. See, God isn't interested, and Pastor Tom and myself are not interested in creating clones. We're not interested in having people that come here and agree with everything we say. Because we will have speakers that come up here and say things that perhaps we disagree with and have different interpretations about, but we want to develop smart, wise Christians who learn to think with God's Christian worldview and think wisely in the earth. And that takes study. It does take energy and effort. So what about everybody that has different views? Because again, we're talking about, can God be trusted? Because I think I can trust him here, but these people say I can't trust him here. And so what do we do with all these different interpretations? And there's no better look than the ancient St. Augustine of Hippo. In essentials, the cross, salvation, soteriology, as you would call it, unity. We all agree, 
Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father except through Jesus. In non-essentials, liberty. You don't want to believe in speaking in tongues? That's fine. You don't want to believe in tithing? That's fine. You don't want to believe in these different things? That, that's fine. You don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit? These are non-essentials. They're not essential to your salvation like the cross of Jesus is. We're going to have liberty, but in all things, love. In all things, love. Don't look for people that agree with you. Look for people that you can love and serve with disagreeing points of view. That's humility. Amen? So now we're talking about covenant. We're going to get into covenant here. And am I asked the question, why covenant? What's significant about covenant? Why covenant in Scripture? And if you've spent any time reading Scripture... From Genesis chapter 9 all the way to the end of the Bible is this common theme, this common thread of covenant. We see it beginning in Genesis chapter 9. We see God making a covenant with Noah. We see God making a covenant with Abraham. And then we see the covenant being ratified in Genesis 15. And then we see the covenant seal of of circumcision in Genesis 17. And then we see the narrative of covenant in the book of Exodus where God takes the children of Israel as his own people and makes a covenant with them at Mount Sinai, as you can see in the picture back there. And then we see God making a covenant with David when it says, from the lineage of David would come the great Mashiach, the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior. And God is doing these covenants. And then we fast forward to what we celebrated on Good Friday. Jesus with the cup said, this is the new covenant ratified by my blood. And my blood is poured out for you to forgive you of your sins. There's this theme of new covenant all throughout Scripture. Now, what is the significance in God's objective with covenant? What's the point? Well, first of all, we can look at it this way. A contract is simply transactional. A covenant is relational. God's endeavor, the end result of covenant, is always relationship. But I ask myself this question, and maybe you ask yourself. Could it God, without binding himself to a, an agreement, without binding himself to certain stipulations, couldn't he then still just have revelation, or sorry, have a relationship with man? Couldn't he just do that? Why bind himself in a covenant agreement when he could just have relationship with anybody he wanted to? Because here's the problem, and this is the point of a covenant is revelation. If you can remember with me, right after the Tower of Babel and before God called Abraham and made a covenant with Abraham, there were no worshipers of Yahweh on earth, of God. Nobody knew who God was. I don't know about you, but it's kind of difficult to have a relationship with somebody you don't know. And so what does God do with this problem is he calls a man who worships other gods from a foreign land and says, hey, I'm going to make a covenant with you so that I can reveal who I am to you. But watch this, not so that Abraham can hoard it, but so that Abraham can be a light to the world. So that through God's covenant with, with Abraham, and eventually Israel, the purpose of that was Israel would show the world what this God is like. And this is where we get the light of the world narrative that Jesus talks about in the book of Matthew. He says, you are the light of the world. But Israel failed in that. And then we fast forward even to Matthew chapter 28 when Jesus is resurrected and he says, you go therefore and make disciples of all nations because you have a new covenant and Jesus fully revealed the Father. And now that we have a a, a relationship with God because of the new covenant that revealed him, we are called to be a light to the world and spread the knowledge of who God is to the nations, not make the mistake of Israel and the nations in the Tower of Babel and hoard it, but spread it. That's the point. And so I want to talk about, when we're talking about covenant, I'm going to look at an Old Testament example 
Well, let's look at this. The covenant is the beginning of God's initiative to reveal himself. Now, we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 29. This is the last sermon that Moses is sharing to the people before he goes on to be with the Lord. So you think whenever this is the last words of somebody, it's kind of important. We should probably pay attention and listen to what he's got to say. And this is what Moses tells the children of Israel. He says in 29 verses 9 to 13. He says, therefore, obey the terms of this covenant so that you will prosper in everything you do. All of you, tribal leaders, elders, officers, all the men of Israel, are standing today in the presence of the Lord your God. Your little ones and your wives with you, as well as the foreigners living among you who chop your wood and carry your water. If you didn't get the picture, everybody. Nobody is excluded. Verse 12. You are standing here today to enter into the covenant of the Lord your God. The Lord is making this covenant, including the curses. Remember that. By entering into the covenant today, he will establish you as his people and confirm that he is your God, just as he promised you and as he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The first thing I want you to see in this scripture is the intimate language used. Now, when you see you as his people and he your God, if you heard me say, yeah, that's my little Layla, or that's my little Johnny, or that's my little Susie, if you hear me use language like that, it's pretty safe to assume that I have quite the intimate relationship with that person. Is, is that safe to assume? Because that possessive language does not exist outside of an intimate, close relationship. And this is possessive language that God is saying, as you enter into this covenant relationship, I'm going to reveal myself to you, and you will be my possession. I think that's awesome. You will be mine, and I, God, will be yours. I think that's awesome that we are in such a relationship with the almighty transcendent God that he considers himself to be yours and to belong to you. And you belong to him. You aren't an outsider. You're not a foreigner. You're someone intimate with him that belongs to him. I think that's really powerful. Now, with this relationship that we're talking about, this intimacy, this is where we moderns jump off the train. Because we live in a world today of modern society of individualism. We are an individualistic society which has proven through the ages is always the downfall of a civilization. This is what a, uh, an individualist, individualism is. What matters most are my needs and wants. We make decisions. Now, not every decision about yourself is bad, but when this, when your needs and wants rule your life, you're, an, you're a narcissist. You're, you're an in, you're, you, you've been sucked into the ways of the world, and you didn't know it. You, you're living worldly. You, you might be saved, but you ain't looking like Jesus. Individualist, it's very easy to... That's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, honor one another... Or treat one another as more important than yourself. Uh-uh, Paul. My needs and wants matter, not theirs. Like the airplane, I'll take care of myself first, and then I'll take care of the passenger. It's not the way of the gospel. I think we forget that the cross of Jesus Christ is not just the source of our salvation, it is also the shape of our salvation. If your life doesn't look like a self-sacrificial denying of your old man, picking up your cross and following Jesus, you have not allowed the gospel to shape you. Amen. Individualism. And so now the problem with an individualistic society is there's no room for covenant. What? The only kind of relationship you can have as an individualist is a consumer relationship, which says this. 
I will be and do for you as long as and to the degree that you are and do for me. Now, these are fantastic because they require no commitment and they feel good. But there is nothing more deceptive than thinking you're living fulfilled. This cannot fulfill you. But these are important because, for instance, I have a lot of consumer relationships. For instance, Vons. I have a consumer relationship with Vons. No, really. And as soon as Vons stops providing high-quality product at low prices, guess what? I'm out. I'm not going to continue to be for them when they stop being for me. But the problem is we try to make that relationship and bring it into Christendom and treat it like, God, I will be for you as long as you are for me. God does not offer a consumer relationship. There is no consumer relationship in Christianity. There is only covenant. Now, I want you to, I want to stress that. There is only, so you can see, there is only covenant relationship that God is offering which is, I will be and do for you regardless of what you do and are to me. I don't need you to fulfill your end of the bargain for me to continue fulfilling my end of the bargain. Covenant, and that's scary. That's why marriage can be scary. Because what happens is when two people agree to this and get married, you have the most fulfilling liberating and empowering, amazing relationship on earth. And it's never too late to start. Start saying, I'm not going to live for my needs anymore, honey. I'm going to live for yours. Now, what happens is when only one person, Pastor Tom, PDA later, he always does that, kissing in the office and stuff. I have to crack down on their, I have to crack down on their stuff. Trying to preach the gospel here. (sighs) You threw my train of thought now. Just kidding. No, but the problem is when only one person in the relationship does this, now you have exploitation and abuse. Where one person is saying, I'm going to treat you as a consumer, but the other one says, I'm going to treat you as a covenant. And you have abuse, you have exploitation, and that's wrong, it's evil. It's what we did to God. This is what God's offering is a covenant relationship. He is not offering something where you come and don't lay your life down. We're going to get there quickly. But we're going to get there. So I'm about to head to the part, which is our favorite part of Easter Sunday. Ready? Law and covenant demands. (laughs) You laughed because you don't like it. But how many of you fools would go buy a house, give, you know, your your down payment without any consequences if they don't hold up their end of the bargain? You say, no, I don't believe in laws. (laughs) I don't believe in consequences. If you don't uphold it, oh well. Individualistic. You have your needs first. I have my needs first. And so they say, okay, I'm going to take your deposit and I'm going to take the house. And you're left with nothing. Obviously, nobody would do that. The, the The covenant demands and the law in the covenant is the very backbone of the covenant. It's what makes the covenant have substance. Without this, there can be no trust. Now, it's interesting, uh, people, uh, uh, are, and they don't argue, but there's, there, there's there, you know, different views of the first covenant with God. Some say Adam and God was the first covenant, and that's cool, that's great. But was, what is significant and interesting is that the first time covenant is used is in Genesis 9, with his covenant with Noah. And what some commentators point out is that mankind, 
and this is right after the flood, had fallen into such sin that neither they could be trusted by God nor God could be trusted by them because the rift between them was so great. So God says, okay then, I gotta bridge this gap and he comes in to make a covenant and says, these are the rules. Now, of course, God, which in, 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 in people don't understand, it didn't make sense for God to, to have stipulations on himself. But God even said, if I don't do my part, I will suffer the curse. Just like if you don't do your part, you won't suffer the curse. Those curses, those demands that if you don't uphold it, that's the legit backbone to where now you understand that if you don't uphold your end of the bargain, you're in trouble. Okay, we get it. There can be trust now. There can be an element of I can trust you with this and so forth. So all throughout scripture, though, we have this, what they call tension in scripture. It's this tension where we've got a liberal reading of Scripture, which is this. You know, yeah, it's important to live holy. Righteousness is important. Sanctification is important. But, you know, God is love, and he's forgiving. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how you live. You're going to be forgiven anyways. So it doesn't really matter. That's the liberal view. The conservative view is, yes, God is love and forgiving, but if you don't perfectly obey the demands of the covenant, you'll be damned. And so there's this tension in Scripture that God purposely creates. It's like, I'm Mr. Longsuffering and forgiving and keeping mercy, but if you mess up, you'll be cursed. God, help me out here. What do I do with this tension? Which leads me to the question, is the covenant relationship with God conditional or unconditional? Because many places in Scripture, God's making it conditional. He's like, I'm going to kill your entire family if you sin. And then in other places, he's unconditional, like, I'm going to love you forever. Nothing you can do can hurt me. Tension. So my question to you, class, is the covenant with God, don't answer, is the covenant with God conditional where it matters how I live or unconditional? It doesn't matter how I live. I want to say that again because I really want to get that point. Does it matter how I live and God will be God to me regardless Or does it not matter how I live? And God will be God to me regardless. Yes. The answer to the question, to solve your attention crisis, is yes. Yes to both. How is that possible? We have this situation in Genesis chapter 15. I'm not going to read it because of time. But in Genesis chapter 15 what many point out is the very climax of the story of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, God says to Abraham, I'm going to ratify my covenant with you. So what I want you to do, Abraham, is this ritual. Now, this ritual was very common in Mesopotamia of that time. But the ritual in the Mesopotamian time was always geared for the lesser individual, the peasant, that wants to have a covenant with the Lord, what the peasant would do is go get the animals, and he would sacrifice the animals, and he would cut them in two, and he would separate them and create an aisle. Very gory, very graphic, but there's a point to that. And what would happen is that the peasant that wants to make a covenant and and pledge loyalty and allegiance to the master would then walk down the aisle of these animal carcasses and in effect saying, if I do not uphold my end of the covenant demands, you have every right to make me like these animals. So you are pledging loyalty unto death. And what God does in Genesis 15 is this ritual. 
He says, Abraham, go get these three animals. And he lists the animals to get. And he cuts them in two and he lays them out and creates this aisle. But there's two extremely shocking things that take place here. And number one, God walked through, not Abram. Abram, you're supposed to walk. You're the benefactor here. It was never for the Lord. It was never for the great one to walk. It was always the subject. But God walked down the middle. Shock number one. And shock number two was what that meant. Was what God was saying. That God would suffer the curse for Abram's disobedience. Is the covenant conditional? Yes. Can you meet the conditions? No. So what are we going to do about that curse? God said he would take it. And God put Abram to sleep. Heavy sleep. When he awoke, there was thick darkness that covered that spot. And what Abram saw was a burning oven and a flaming torch walk that aisle. The burning oven was always principally used in that time to bake bread. A picture of the bread of life. And the torch of fire representing the judgment of God. And 2,000 years later, a man hung on a cross and thick darkness covered the earth. And Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in scriptures, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham. So that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Jesus lived the perfect life of covenant obedience for our blessing. And then he was sacrificed to bear our curse. What God does that? And now we enter what we call and what we'll be discussing in the coming weeks, the new covenant with God. In my final few minutes, there's four main points that this covenant means for us. It's going to wrap up our questions. It's number one, paradoxical obedience. The new covenant is such that the, the answer to the question, does how I live really matter? It has never mattered more than it does today. Have you seen what sin cost? Have you seen what covenant disobedience led to? Have you seen the other side of the covenant, the greatness, the love, and the care of this God? And for you to say it doesn't value, it's not valuable enough to change the way I live or my values. It has never mattered more than under the new covenant to live holy. But here's the catch you have never been more forgiven than you are now. 
Because in the same breath that Jesus rescued you from the curse, he empowered you by the Spirit to walk like him. So for you to say, it doesn't really matter, God will forgive me anyway, is heresy. It has never mattered more, but it's not by your will, it's not by your might, it's not by your power, it's by his spirit. So every covenant demand he has, which there are many in the new covenant, he has empowered you and equipped you to walk in. It has never mattered more. It's paradoxical obedience. There has never been a more obedient people on earth than there is now. Why? Because we, are, we have the key. We have what no other generation had, the indwelling presence and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, that you are anointed and called for such a time as this to live courageously, to live boldly, and to live sanctified, and to live holy in the midst of a perverse generation by the power of the Holy Spirit. So does it matter? It's never mattered more. But guess what? You will miss it. You will fail. And Jesus is there to remind you, I've rescued you from your failure. I've rescued you from the curse that you deserve because I took it upon myself. So the pressure of performance is gone and the empowerment to be holy is there. What a beautiful covenant. Number two, can God be trusted? So the thing with entering in a relationship is you don't fully know the person yet. But once you get to know the person, your level of trust goes up or down, depending on their actions. Do they keep their word? Do they love how I make them feel, or do they love me? Are they looking for a consumer relationship where they're going to be with me as long as the going's good? And if I'm being completely honest, which, of course, I shall be, because covenant demands. One of the hardest things about being a pastor, and, and with Pastor Tom being in ministry 45 years, is you think people are entering in a covenant relationship with you. But you find out it was just a consumer relationship. They were just looking for me to scratch their ears. And as soon as their ears stopped getting scratched, they gone. And I said, oh, what about a goodbye? Hi, friend. I had a covenant relationship. I was in this for you to serve you regardless if you served me. And again, in the church... There's no place for a consumer relationship. This is a holy place of covenant. Where when we join, which leads to number three, church partnership. Our covenant with God necessitates covenant with each other. And I don't like church membership because membership gives the idea of what? Consumer. I'm here, slice my card, get my bread, and go home. It's not what God calls us to. He calls us to covenant with him and covenant with one another, which welcome to the sanctification process. That is extremely difficult, but so fulfilling. When you can have real relationships with people that aren't based on you meeting their needs, because that's exhausting. But knowing that someone on the other end of that relationship will be there for you and be to you regardless of what you are to them. Can Jesus be trusted? There is no one more worthy of trust. He has already plunged the depths of love, and there is nothing more he can do to prove his level of love for you. And he's not looking for a consumer relationship. He's not looking for you to say, thank you for heaven, Jesus. Goodbye. He's not looking for those relationships. Why? Because those aren't, don't mean anything. There's no depth to them. 
You know how God measures things? You know how God measures churches? Not by their size, by their depth. How much does it weigh? God measures our lives by what it weighs. God measures our relationship by what it weighs. You may have all of the signs of success, but you're shallow. God doesn't want that. He doesn't want a relationship where you just take from him. He says, this is who I am in Matthew 16. And in the very next breath, he says, therefore. See, because an identity, when you see who Jesus is, it is therefore now your choice to identify with him. And he says, to be my disciple, I'm asking you to deny yourself and to pick up the cross and follow me. For he who loses my life will find it. He's asking us to do what he's already done. Why? Covenant. Covenant relationship. And finally, number four, get serious about God. What do I mean by that? All throughout scripture, we see people Begging with the listeners, today is the day of salvation. Don't wait to tomorrow to answer the covenant call. Don't wait till time is right and you feel better about your life. Because God is not someone impersonal. He's not a foreign force or faceless being. He's a person. And C.S. Lewis has this quote that tugs on my heart, and I hope it tugs on yours. An impersonal God, well and good. It's easier when you don't have to face an impersonal God. A subjective God of beauty, truth, and goodness inside our own heads, even better still. A lot of people worshiping this following a God of their creation. I'm spiritual, I'm just not religious. Know what you've done is you've created a God of your own making that hasn't challenged you and caused you and led you to the altar. It's convenient. And as C.S. Lewis says, yes, give me one of those gods. A formless life force surging through us, a vast power which we can tap, best of all. Let me tell you about this power in you and anything you ever need, boom. That's a God I want, a genie with multiple wishes. But God himself, alive, pulling at the other end of the cord, a person, Perhaps approaching you at an infinite speed. The hunter, the king, the husband. That is quite another matter. It's the opposite, friends, of the better still, the well and good, and the best of all. It can be scary. It can be nerve-wracking. Because I'm not facing an impersonal force. I'm facing a person with a face, with real love and emotion and who has expressed his love, and for me to face this person and to say, nah, nah, I'm not gonna answer the call. It's easy to do that with an impersonal person. It's much more difficult with someone who has plunged the depths of love and is calling on you to come have a covenant relationship with him he can be trusted. Amen? If I can have every head bowed and eye closed. Maybe you're watching online and I pray you are. I pray you stayed. And you've never made this answer to the covenant call of God. You're saying, Lord, I want to follow you. And the beauty is there is no perfect way to follow him. And you will make so many mistakes. All he's asking for 
is will you come to the covenant table? Will you break bread with him? Will you say, God, I will continue to pursue you. I pledge loyalty to you and you alone and transform my life. If you've never made that commitment today, I wanna give you that opportunity right now. We've been praying for you. We've been believing God for you that, that the Holy Spirit would comfort you and that he would reveal to you how much you matter to him. And he's not looking for a superficial relationship. He's looking for this real, authentic covenant relationship that's for eternity. And all it takes is a yes. Scripture says in Romans chapter 10 that all who confess with their mouth that Jesus died and today we celebrate rose again and believe in their heart, they will be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord, Scripture says, God is rich unto them. And that's all it takes. Friend, Jesus is calling. He's summoning you to the covenant table to break bread with him and the rest of his people. And if that's you and you're watching online or you're here in the house, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Don't have to say it out loud. You can just say it from the depths of your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I give my life to you. I say yes to your call. I say yes to your covenant. I know it won't be perfect, but I have your forgiveness. And I also have your spirit indwelling in me to empower me to walk like you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins and give me new life right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, can we give a hand to people that may have just prayed that for the first time? Hey, listen, if you did pray that prayer for the first time, or maybe it's the hundredth time, on the screen there'll be a QR code that'll pop up. Or if you're here in the building, there's QR codes behind the seats. We really would love if you could scan that. And in that worship program that will come up is a connection card. And we would love for you to fill that out and let us know that you made that commitment today that you made a decision to follow Jesus. And if you're online, I'm gonna leave it up for just a minute longer. Scan that now. Please let us know. We've been praying for you. Because we don't wanna just leave you like an orphan, but we wanna help you. And maybe this isn't the right church for you. There are lots of good churches around here. And we would love to even help you find a church, a community for you to get connected in, for you to have accountability and have real relationships with other people. So if that's you, please let us know by filling out that connection card on our digital worship program and we'll be praying for you and believe God has an amazing destiny for you. God bless you guys. Happy Easter. He is risen. He's the mediator of, oh, yep. He's the mediator of a new and better covenant. Amen. That's right.